Okay, so imagine if we could like rewrite literary history, you know, and entertain the idea that Shakespeare's plays were actually written who faked his own death. Oh, wow. Sounds like a conspiracy theory, right? Yeah. Well, that's what we're diving into today. Um, a YouTube video essay that lays out a surprisingly compelling case for Christopher Marlowe, Shakespeare's contemporary, and some argue right. as the true author of the Shakespearean canon. I know, questioning the authorship of such iconic works that seems almost sacrilegious. Right. But what's fascinating is that this essay doesn't rely on mere speculation. Okay. It uses historical records and digs deep into the literary techniques of the Elizabethan era to make its case. Okay, let's unpack this. The video essay centers around a text called Polymente published in 1595 under the mysterious initials WC. Okay. Um, it was published right at the start of Shakespeare's mm -hmm. career. Or should we say the alleged end? Of Marlowe's. Great. Just kidding. No sound effects needed. This story's dramatic enough. On its own. Rightfully so. The essay claims that W.C. Is actually Marlowe. Wow. In hiding after faking his death in 1593. What? And get this. It claims this book was his way of revealing his situation. Through England's elite. Wow. Through allegory and hidden messages hey one allegory for those of us who haven't brushed up on their literary terms lately oh uh, what exactly is that good point allegory where it characters and represent abstract ideas was a popular literary device in elizabethan england okay think of it as a coded language that allowed writers to tackle to sensitive subjects oh. without directly confronting authority ah so like a literary secret handshake right okay so polymentia this alleged confession in disguise what's it all about on the surface. Polymentia is structured as a dialogue between yeah. Mother England and her three daughters okay. representing Cambridge, Oxford, and the court. But the essay argues there's this whole other layer about a personal downfall. One that eerily mirrors Marlowe's own life. I love where this is going. So we're talking secret identities, hidden messages, and a literary mystery. Centuries in the making. Yeah. This is giving me serious Dan Brown vibes. Right? The comparison is apt. The essay highlights specific lines in Polamentea where W.C. talks about being falsely accused oh, hey. and forced into exile. Okay. This is particularly intriguing. Given that Marla was facing curious charge. Some heresy and treason. Around the time. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Marlo! Accused of heresy and treason. Supposedly dies. Under mysterious circumstances. Then a couple years later. This book, Polymentea, pops up. Right. Written by a mysterious W.C. And this W.C. just happens to be writing about. And falsely accused. And living in exile. Exactly. Come on. It's as if Marlo. Is pouring his heart out. In this text. But disguised as political commentary. Right. The essay even points out. How does a W.C uses his own life as a metaphor for the state of England. Okay. Blurring the line between personal struggles always... facing the entire nation. Okay. So we've got some intriguing parallels here. But how does the essay connect these alleged coded messages to the actual work of Shakespeare? Well, this is where things get really interesting. Okay. The essay doesn't just stop at vague connections. It uncovers all these little Easter eggs Beckler. sprinkled throughout Paula Mantea that seem to link back to Marlowe. It highlights how Paula Mantea right, is full text. of references to Marlowe's known okay. similar phrases. Shared themes. We have a possible connection. To Ben Johnson. Whoa, hold on. Ben Johnson. As in Shakespeare's contemporary. Ben Johnson. The very same. Wow. The essay suggests that these connections aren't just coincidences. Right. They're deliberate breadcrumbs. Okay. Left by Marlowe. To reveal his true identity. As the author behind the Shakespearean works. Wow. And the breadcrumbs don't stop there. Oh. <laughs> Tell me more. This is my favorite part. I'm ready for more clues. Well, the essay focuses on how Marlowe uses the marigold flower. Okay. As a recurring symbol throughout his work. Almost like a secret signature. Oh, wow. The marigold appears in Polymontea okay. in Marlowe's poem Hero and Leander. And and this is where it gets really interesting. Later in a work by the poet Michael Drayton. Hold on. The essay proposes that Drayton might have been another one of Marlowe's pseudonyms. Wait, hold on a second. Let me make sure I understand this. 
we're talking about one person. Marlo. Potentially yeah. living under multiple identities. Writing under different names. Dropping clues. Like a literary. Carmen San Diego. Right? This is incredible. But also. Kind of hard to believe. Are we really putting that much stuff? In a single flower. You're right to be cautious. The essay acknowledges. Relying solely on symbolism. Could be a stretch. However, when you combine this marigold motif with the other textual evidence the essay presents it starts to build a pretty compelling gaze. case okay you've definitely got my attention i'm hooked before we go any further down this rabbit hole i have to ask if this theory is true and it's a big if how could marlo have vanished without a trace right and how did shakespeare the guy from Stratford upon Avon. The man whose name appeared. On all those plays. Figure into all of this. These are excellent questions. And they get to the heart of the mystery. But to understand the essay's answers. We need to take a closer look at the historical context. Surrounding Marlowe's supposed death. And the world in which. <laughs> Shakespeare. So imagine Elizabethan England, a time of incredible intellectual and artistic ferment, but also a time of political intrigue and religious persecution. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm picturing those portraits of Queen Elizabeth all roughs and stern expressions. Right. It doesn't seem like a I world want to be. on the wrong side of power. Exactly. And Marlowe, with his sharp wit a and tangents, was already walking a dangerous line. Right. The essay suggests that the accusations of heresy and treason against him might have been part of a larger effort to silence him. Okay. Perhaps by people in high places who felt threatened. By his writing. Okay, so we're talking about... Conspiracy, then. Powerful people yeah. trying to shut down. The playwright. But why go through this elaborate charade? Of faking Marlowe's death. Right. When throwing him in prison. Be simpler. That's where the essay gets really interesting. Okay. It speculates that Marlowe... Might have had protectors? Within the court itself. People uh, who recognized his talent. And perhaps even secretly agreed with some of his what? more controversial views so it's like a spy thriller with double agents and secret alliances right who would these protectors have been and why go to such lengths this to save him the essay doesn't name names but it paints a picture of the court divided by competing ideologies and ambitions okay. it suggests that marlo might have been caught in a power struggle Okay. Between those who wanted to control my narrative of the Elizabethan age. Right. And those who championed freedom of thought. Faking his death. According to the essay. Allowed Marlowe to escape this dangerous game. While continuing to write wow. under the cut of the yeah. Shakespeare pseudonym. This is mind blowing. But it still doesn't explain how the Shakespeare from Stratford upon Avon. A man whose name appears on all those plays figures into all of this. That's the million dollar question. Right. The essay suggests that Shakespeare from Stratford that might have been a stand in. Someone paid to maintain the illusion of Shakespeare as the author while Marlowe worked in the shadows. Wait a minute. A literary decoy. So we're saying there might, might have been. been a grand deception involving powerful patrons and a whole eight news and a really good plays it sounds incredible right yeah but when you consider the stakes involved right marlo's well, life the power of his words the political and religious tensions of elizabethan england it doesn't seem quite far-fetched right remember this was a time when the theater held a mirror up to society Reflecting its anxieties, its desires, yes. and its deepest fears. Control over the stage. Main control over the hearts and minds. Okay, I can see how controlling the narrative, especially in that time period, would be crucial. Right. But if we entertain this theory, and even for a moment, it makes you wonder you about you of authorship itself. Right. Who really owns a story? And how much does the author's identity matter if the words themselves? Are and resonant. These are questions that have been debated for centuries. But the possibility yeah. might be the true author of Shakespeare's works adds a whole new layer of complexity. It challenges us to rethink our assumptions about, the, about who gets to be remembered and whose voices. It's was almost as if Marlowe, through his supposed death, and achieved a strange and endure immortality. Right. Living on through these incredible works, even as his true identity were made hidden. 
It's a captivating thought. Isn't it? It is. Yes, to the enduring the power of art. To transcend boundaries. Even the boundary. Between life and death. This is all incredibly intriguing. But I have to ask. Is there anyone else? Who believes this theory. Right. Are there any historians. Or literary scholars. Who support the idea. Of Marlowe as Shakespeare. Or is oh. this just one rogue YouTube video essay. Claiming to crack the code. Of literary history. That's a fair question. Well, the traditional view. It treats works. Of Stratford. <laughs> right. There's actually a long history. Of debate. And, and scent. Surrounding the authorship. Of the Shakespearean canon. So there are other Shakespearean sleuths out there. Oh, yeah. Tell me more about them. Oh, there As anti Stratfordians. Okay. And they've been around. Anti Stratfordians are. Scholars and enthusiasts. And independent researchers. Okay. To question. For various reasons. The traditional attribution. To William Shakespeare. Is Stratford upon Avon. Some of their arguments stem from. Perceived inconsistency. In Shakespeare's biography. Okay. The complexity of the plays. And, and even stylistic similarities. To Marlowe's known works. Okay, so it's not no, just... On YouTube video. There's a whole community of people. Dedicated to unraveling this mystery. It's true. That but makes this... Even more fascinating. Right? It's like we've stumbled onto... One of those historical enigmas. That people have been debating. For ages. You've hit the nail on the head. And that's part... Of what makes exploring history. So rewarding. Right. It's not just about... Memorizing dates and names. Huh, right. It's about engaging. You these ongoing conversations, mm -hmm. questioning assumptions. And uncovering hidden layers. Of the meaning. That this deep dive. It has thrown open a window. Expert room. In literary history. Yeah. We might not have. Of all the answers. That's all we see what's been revealed. Exactly. But where do we go from here? We've got this intriguing theory. Some compelling evidence. And a whole community of people. Dedicated to uncovering the truth. About Shakespeare's authorship. But what are we supposed I mean, to leave take away of? from all of this? Right. What's the, so what? That's the ultimate question, isn't it? And I think the answer. Well, most things in history. Is complex okay. and multifaceted. Even if we accept the possibility. That Marlowe might be. The true author. It doesn't diminish the power and beauty to the plays themselves. You're not saying you should toss out all pus of Shakespeare with portraits. Women. Not necessarily, but it does challenge us to think critically about we consume the stories and the legacy. Celebrate. It's like holding up a prism and realize there are more colors, right? More facets than we initially perceived. Precisely. It's about embracing the story. The possibility might be even more complex and fascinating than we ever imagined right and speaking of complexity and intrigue there's one more fascinating detail from this video essay that i think you'll find okay particularly thought provoking it involves a hidden message but not the kind you might expect okay you know uh, i can't resist a good cliffhanger lay it on me what's this about Another hidden message. This is where things get really meta. Okay. The video essay points out. That Palamente itself. Contains a kind of. Hidden message. Okay. One that seems to directly address. The question of authorship. And the very nature. It's truth itself. Wait, hold on. Are we talking about a secret message? Within a secret message. So true. Within this 16th century text. You got it. Wow. And here's the really mind-bending part. This hidden message okay. seems to foreshadow the very debate we're having right now, wow. centuries later. It's almost as if Marlowe, assuming he's WC, knew that his true identity yeah. would one day be questioned. And he planted this message as a kind of breadcrumb oh, for future generations to find. Okay, now I have to know more. What does this hidden message say? And how does it connect? To the Shakespeare authorship question. To understand the full impact. Of this hidden message. We need to rewind a bit and um, delve deeper. Into the historical context. Surrounding Marlowe's. Supposed. Death. Okay. Because it turns out. Those accusations. Their heresy and treason. Weren't the only things. Not or threatened. To them. silence him. There were rumors. A cress. Of something even more dangerous. Okay. Something that could have shattered. Yeah, very foundations. Of Elizabethan society. Okay. You got me on the edge of my seat here. What could be more scandalous than heresy and treason in Elizabethan England? The essay suggests that Marlowe might have been hinting at something even more radical, something that truly threatened the social and religious order of the time, atheism. Atheism? Ah, 
Wow, yeah, that would definitely raise a few eyebrows, to say the least. But how could anyone even know about that? Were there secret atheist societies running around Elizabethan England? While organized atheism was practically unheard of in that era, the essay points out that Marlowe was known for his questioning mind and his willingness to push boundaries. Remember those accusations of heresy. Some scholars believe that his plays contain subtle critiques of religious dogma, hidden in plain sight within the language and characters. So he was subtly challenging religious beliefs through his writing like a 16th century free thinker. Precisely. And this is where the Paul Mante connection gets really fascinating. Paula Mantea emphasizes hidden truths and things not being what they seem. The essay proposes that Marlowe might have used this text to gauge public reaction, to see if he could subtly introduce these radical ideas without facing deadly consequences. That's incredibly risky. Talking about atheism back then was like playing with fire, literally. Exactly. And what's fascinating is that the hidden message in Paula Mantea hinting at atheism also acknowledges the danger inherent in revealing such beliefs. It's almost as if Marlowe was both challenging and pleading with his readers, daring them to see the truth, while also fearing for his life. It sounds like he was walking a tightrope between self-expression and self-preservation. But if he was so concerned about the consequences, why even include these hidden messages in the first place? Wouldn't it have been safer to just keep quiet? That's the question that lies at the heart of this whole mystery, isn't it? The essay doesn't offer a definitive answer, but it speculates that perhaps for Marlowe, silence was unbearable. Maybe the urge to express himself, even at great personal risk, was too strong to resist. So if this theory is right, we're talking about someone who is willing to risk everything, his reputation, his freedom, even his life, to bring his ideas to the world. It's a powerful testament to the human need to create, to connect, and to challenge the status quo. It is indeed. And it forces us to consider the sacrifices that artists and thinkers throughout history have made to share their vision with the world. This deep dive started with a simple question. Did Marlowe write Shakespeare? But it's become about so much more. Identity authorship, the courage to speak truth to power, and the enduring power of ideas. And that's the beauty of exploring history. It's not just about the past. It's about understanding ourselves and the world around us in a deeper, more meaningful way. This has been such a thought-provoking deep dive. So as we wrap up, what's the one big takeaway you hope our listeners will walk away with today? If there's one thing I hope our listeners take away from this exploration, it's this. Never be afraid to question what you think you know. History is not set in stone. It's a living, breathing tapestry woven from countless perspectives and interpretations. And sometimes the most captivating stories are the ones hidden just beneath the surface waiting for us to uncover them. It's been a wild ride, and I, for one, am still trying to process all of this. This is definitely one for the history books, or maybe we should say a reason to rewrite those history books. Indeed. And who knows, maybe someday we'll have definitive answers to the mysteries surrounding Marlowe Shakespeare and this fascinating chapter in literary history. Until then, keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep the spirit of curiosity alive.